Good morning, church. It's great to see you guys. My name is Jason. We are excited to worship with you this morning. Can we stand to our feet? And as we do, I'm going to pray for us as we enter into worship this morning. Father, we just thank you for who you are. And God, I just continue to come before you and just thank you that we can worship together with all these brothers and sisters in Christ. God, I pray that you would go before us. And um, God, I'm just so thankful to be able to worship you together this morning. God, I pray that uh, you'd be glorified in all that we say and do and think. We give this back to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, church. Oh, 
Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking. Well, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus.
have chosen me Love has called my name I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins And I'm no This morning, church, you guys can be seated. Well, good morning, New Hope. We are so glad you've chosen to join us today. Our mission here is to help people find hope 
one step at a time. We want to love you where you're at, wherever you are in your faith journey, and help you take your next step. If this is your first time visiting us, we'd love to connect with you. Take a moment after the service to stop by our guest services desk in the lobby for a small gift and more information about New Hope and our ministries. Our care ministry is passionate about bringing hope, healing, and truth to those who are facing life's challenges. If you're in a season of grief, know that you don't have to go through it alone. Registration is open for our next session of Loss of a Spouse, a Grief Share Seminar. If you're grieving the death of a spouse, no matter how long it's been, join us next Sunday, April 28th at 1230 p.m. for practical encouragement from people who have been there. For ongoing weekly care as you walk through grief, our care ministry also offers a Grief Share Life Group with a new session beginning Tuesday, April 30th. More information and registration can be found on our app and at newhopecc.org slash events. Mark your calendars for our next Ignite Night of Worship. This is an incredible night where we come together as a church family to worship through song and prayer. We'll also be honoring our graduating senior class of 2024. So meet us right here in the main campus on Wednesday, May 8th, beginning at 6.30 p.m. Bring the whole family. All ages are welcome. As always, we are so appreciative of your financial support for New Hope and our ongoing ministries. Your tithes and offerings make it possible for us to continue sharing the gospel here, there, and everywhere. If you'd like to give, you can set up a one-time or recurring gift online or place your offering in the boxes by the doors. Now join us as we dive into the Word of God together. So before we get started, quick announcement. You might have noticed in the lobby there's some bins of m and So we have a group of junior high and senior high students going to camp, and uh, it's not cheap. In fact, I mean, when you were a kid, it was like you gave a camp 50 bucks and they kept you for the summer. Um, those days are over, all right? And so camp is not cheap, and uh, so we want to help send our students to camp. So what I'm going to ask you to do is after service, don't go do it now, um, in the lobby is M&M's. Go get a tube of M&M's, all right? Write your name down, your information, and then I want you to eat and enjoy those M&M's like they're the best M&M's you've ever had. They're probably not, but just pretend. And, uh, and then I want you to take that empty tube, and you're going, what do I do with an empty tube? Don't throw it away. I want you to put money in it and then bring it back, all right? That's how that works. Um, we used to, like, sometimes the M&M tubes fit coins perfectly. We got small tubes. They don't fit coins, but you know what it does fit? Cash. Uh, so you can roll up cash. You can stick that in there. Checks work too, all right? Uh, a check will send somebody to camp. So it, it's just a huge blessing that our people can send our students to camp. So if you wouldn't mind doing that after the service, get out there quick before they run out, all right, and uh, grab you a tube of M&Ms. So I still love the game of basketball. Like, I, I like, I still play, like, I still hoop, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's hard to take the hooper out of the hooper, you know? Like, it's just there. And um, I'm, I'm not terrible, but, you know, I'm 40. And, I mean, you can put the pieces together with what you're looking at. This in my hands is not very valuable. In fact, it's worth nothing. In fact, if I toss this to one of you, you would take it home and it would end up in your garage. And then it would just be a piece of junk around your house. You put this in Steph Curry's hands, and now all of a sudden, this is worth $50 million a year. The same ball in a different pair of hands is worth a lot more money. And then, you know, football. I mean, I played football, and I still love to throw the old pace skin around. I don't pad up and hit anymore because we'd break everything in our bodies. This in my hands is worthless, absolutely worthless. But you put it in Pat Mahomes' hands, and it's worth half a billion dollars over 10 years. Can, can we also stop and talk about these amounts of money? Like, I just said half a billion dollars. You're like, oh, yeah, he's probably worth it, you know. It's ridiculous how much money is floating around professional sports. 
But like these things are just things, but the tools in somebody else's hands, all of a sudden the value just goes through the roof. But in my hands, the value is just not there. This is why when we talk about being made in the image of God and we read something like we read last week in Genesis where it says God took the dust of the earth and he formed it with his hands and he breathed the breath of life into it. Well, goodness, there's a lot of value in that now. And that's me and you. And these tools in the right hands, all of a sudden the value is through the roof. That's why when you look in the book of Isaiah... I think it's Isaiah 64. Someone, if I'm wrong, you'll correct me, I'm sure. But the writer says that we're like clay. And and we're this work in the master's hands. Because there's like intrinsic value based on who created the thing. Again, if I make a piece of pottery, it's not really any good. My mom might like it. That's about it. But like when the master makes something, all of a sudden the value is so high. And this is the problem if we refuse to see ourselves as being made in the image of of God, we will set out unintentionally to live a worthless life. We'll self-attribute that. And just to review last week, you know, because what we're talking about this week is so foundational on last week. We, you know, we're in the series, Imago Dei, the image of God. And God makes everything, but then he makes us unique. It's, it's a different process. There's an intimacy. And he makes us in his image, and he gives us the authority to rule and to reign on the earth, which is a thing reserved for kings, ruling and reigning. And God says, I'm going to make you, and I'm going to allow you to do this thing. There was a, a problem, and we touched on it a little bit last week, and the problem is this. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, you remember this iconic moment where they eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil that they're not supposed to eat from. And in that moment, sin and chaos enter the world. And there was a brokenness, there was a fracture that took place, and part of that was a fracture in the mirror we see ourselves in. And, and we now, maybe, not maybe, we don't do things the way we're supposed to do. This is, this is why you'll see things in the world. Like, you'll hear these amazing stories of people that do incredibly good things. I mean, you, you'll, you'll hear stories of people who have given their lives to fight sex trafficking and to, to fight child slavery and, and to end hunger in certain parts of our world and to fight poverty and we go man people are they have the ability to do such good but then you look around the world and you go but boy do we have the potential to do such incredibly evil vile things how can this happen because there's this phrase that's thrown around that people are inherently good and actually I mean that's that was the intention Right? We were supposed to rule and reign in a good way. But because of sin, because of brokenness, now we have the potential to do it in a harmful way. To use this authority, this ruling and reigning, to do bad. This is why, as the perfect image of God, Jesus is the key to God's plan for redemption for the whole world. Okay, And I know that's like a really... Churchy phrase. Let me, let me read it again. As the perfect image of God, Jesus is the key to God's plan for redemption for the whole world. So there was a plan that was set in place to redeem the world, to reconcile people back to himself. The plan was Jesus. And, and so we come along, we go through our calendar, and we get you know, through fall, and we get to Christmas time, and we talk about Emmanuel, God with us, and we sing the songs, and we have the Christmas talks, and it's all great, but like the power of Jesus coming to earth, that was the plan, to reconnect us, to reconcile us, to redeem us to what we were supposed to do. And the Bible tells us that all of these 
issues would be resolved when God bound himself to humanity in Jesus. Like God is doubling down on his commitment to humanity and seeing the uniqueness of that creation. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. If you have a Bible and you want to turn there, Colossians 1 starting in verse 15. Christ is the image, there's our word, right? Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is the body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. This, if you're an underliner, underline this. For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, through Jesus, through Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. So there's really two things we need to understand about this text. Two words specifically. You have the word image. Christ is the image. It's the icon, and it means not just likeness in outward appearance, but the same in every facet. This verse could actually read, uh, and in fact in some translations it does, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Meaning, when we see Jesus, we see God. That is huge. People talk about all the time, I wish I knew what God was like. I wish I knew what God was like. What's God like? What's God like? We know exactly what he's like because Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. He is the visible that we can see God, of God. That's huge. That, that, it is absolutely huge. And then he used the word at the end, right? For God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ. I mean, in the fullest expression. Again, not just an outward appearance, like looked a little bit like him, but the same in every facet. Every facet. And through him, through Jesus, God reconciles everything to himself. I mean, this is a, uh, it's a bank term, right? We've got to reconcile the books. They have to make sense. They have to balance out. Things have to even out. It's actually made up of two words, apo and katalasso. Op, apo meaning separation, katalasso, return to favor with. There's a separation and a returning to favor with. You put them together, it means to bring back to a state of harmony. There's an understanding when we say to bring back to a state of harmony. There was an original state of harmony, creation. But because of choices, because of free will, the harmony was disrupted. It, it, it wasn't in sync anymore. And so God's plan was through Jesus, right, sending Jesus in the fullest expression of himself in every facet to reconcile us, to redeem us, to bring us back into right standing with him, to bring harmony with him. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? To think that we could live in harmony with God. You ever, you ever know, like, I, I, okay, I grew up in like a, a, a church tradition where we had like the southern gospel groups come in. I know I've shared this before. And I was convinced that I was going to be in one of those as a kid. Like I would sit in the front row and I would sing extra loud so they would hear my talent and they would invite me onto the tour bus. That was my plan. I was going to leave my family at nine to sing with whatever southern gospel group was coming through. But when you strip away the instruments and you hear these incredible harmonies, like musically, there is hardly anything better than good harmonies. And there's really something unique that happens. Like if, if you know a family that sings, like it's really hard to beat family harmonies. 
like sibling harmonies. They just do it different than everybody else. Like they just know each other. They know their voices. There's this harmony and there's this like moment where everything is like, it just musically makes sense and sounds fantastic. We have the ability to live in harmony with God. This beautiful, make sense kind of way. So there's this separation, but that wasn't the end because there's this ability to return to favor with. Apo katalasso. You see this idea of Jesus being the image of God, not just in Colossians, but you see it all over the pages of Scripture. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, the Son radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. And He sustains everything by the mighty power of His command. When He had cleansed us from our sins, He sat down in the place of honor of the right hand of the majestic God in heaven. Right, the sun radiates God's glory. In John 1.18, no one has ever seen God, but the unique one, Jesus, who is himself God, is near the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. In John chapter 5, verse 19, so Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. For the Father loves the Son and shows him everything he is doing. A little bit later in Colossians chapter 2, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. It's so important that we understand this concept that we are made in the image of God, but there was a problem, and the solution to the problem was Jesus being the full expression, the fullness of God in a human body, perfection, who would live and die for us so that we could be reconciled to God, we could be reconnected so that we could live in harmony with God. So, what is God like? It's not a mystery anymore. And I think there's two, two things that we can look at. The first is we can look at Jesus' teachings. We can look at the things he said. There's this famous sermon. It's kind of like the first time we see Jesus preach. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. It's in Matthew chapter 5. Now, some people think like this was like Matthew was over on the side. I don't know what he was, you know, with his papyrus. And he was just frantically scribbling down everything Jesus said word for word in this singular sermon on a mountainside. But a lot of people believe what really is happening is Jesus, he taught a lot. I mean, he was a teacher. And these were the things that Jesus taught regularly. Like they were the greatest hits. These were Jesus' greatest hits. And yes, he sat on this mountainside and he did preach a sermon and more than likely, Matthew didn't catch everything verbatim, but these were the things to the groups as Jesus traveled around and he taught. These were the things he taught. And it's important that we understand that because there's a repetition there. Like, these are important things to Jesus. More than likely, more than likely, you have things that have been repeated in your family, that have been taught to you, the greatest hits of your family tradition. You know, my, my dad always taught me different sayings. And it was, if you are not early, you're late. So I have this disease where I get everywhere way too early. Because in my mind, it is so ingrained that if I'm not there at least 15 minutes early, I'm late. Some of y'all need to learn that lesson. Boy. You know, some of you heard like, hey, you know what? Show up late to the party. That was, the, that was your fifth. So I'm going to ask you, what are some appropriate Family things your family taught you growing up. Just say them out loud. What are they? You can't outgive God. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything at all. What else? Also, they teach you growing up, never lie, but then you get married. And someone asks you a question, you're like, man, this feels like a lie would work right here really well. You know what I'm saying? What else? What, what, what'd your grandma, your parent, what'd they teach you growing up? Treat others the way you want to be treated. There's, only, there's more than one way to skin a cat. Not there's only one way to skin a cat. 
Family business stays in the family. Money doesn't grow on trees? Yeah, I heard that one a lot. But it's paper, so technically it does. What else? What was that? In or out. Man, that's like such a phrase that, like, no context. I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you, when you grow up a certain way and money's tight, you're like, in or out. Don't leave the door open. And I find myself saying these things. And I'm like, why is dad losing his mind over that? What an idiot, you know? And now I'm 40 and I'm like, oh, no, I'm saying them and I'm doing them. These, like, so these are the things that Jesus' followers knew and understood. Like, these were his teachings. So I'm not going to read all of it to you because it's actually not that long of a sermon. But we're not, we're not going to spend the whole time to read it. But I just want to read a little bit because I think it captures the heart of his teaching. So in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. So like, these are the things that Jesus said. And when, when we read these, not only do we understand what Jesus was like, but we actually understand what God is like and what God cares about and what moves God's heart. Today is very participatory, okay? So I'm just going to need you to be bold. What, what are some, like Jesus also taught in these parables, right? And you see all these different parables. What are some of the parables Jesus shares in his teachings? What are they? Okay, the parable of the different soils, prodigal son. Like, let's pause on that one for a second. Um, so there's this story that Jesus tells. It wasn't a true story, but it's just a story. And it's about this father and his sons, and the one son is an idiot. That's my interpretation, but he's just kind of a jerk. And so he asks his dad, hey, I care more about your money than you. Can you give me my inheritance before you die? Right? And so the dad says, yeah, if that's what you want. So he gives the money to his son, and the son goes off, and he just squanders all the money on living this wild life, and he finds himself at the lowest of lows. He's out of money, he has nowhere to go, he has no food, and he's contemplating eating with pigs. And he has a thought. I wonder if I could go back home to my dad. And so he humbles himself, and he makes the journey back home, not to ask to be a son, but to just go, can I just be one of your servants because you, you treat them better than I have experienced in this world. And the father sees the son coming and he doesn't wait, he runs out to meet him and he says, hey, bring him a robe and bring him a ring and let's throw a party. When Jesus tells this parable, he's describing God. Right? So like, when we hear Jesus' teachings, these aren't just good teachings, which they are, but they actually are a picture of what God is like. What, what are some other parables, Jesus? The talons, the, uh, the 99, right, leaves the one for the 99, the 10 virgins, good the good Samaritan. Yeah, like, again, all of these stories, if you look at them with the lens of like, Jesus isn't just trying to make a point. He's showing us what God is like. And these stories like change all of a sudden. They take on new meanings. So we can look at all of these teachings, but not only that. One thing we, we teach our kids or we want to teach our kids is like, 
be a person of your word or, you know, a person of integrity does the things they say they're going to do, right? Or they, they walk the walk, we would say it. So not only do we have what Jesus says, but we actually have his walk. We, we see how he lived. I mean, he showed us, this is why Jesus coming in human form is so important, because he showed us what it's like to rule and to reign as a human. And how did he do that? By serving, seeking the best for others, not thinking himself higher than everybody else, even though he could have. And not just his friends, but also enemies. Not just Jewish people, but Samaritans and the rest of the world. And so he takes on all the evil in the world, literally, and he lets it kill him. And in so doing, says, this is what it's like to leverage your authority. This is what it's like to rule and to reign. This is what you should do with the authority you've been given. Not plant a stake in the ground and go, this is mine and this is how I'm doing this, but to actually leverage it to the benefit of other people. And the only way to do that is to be reconciled, reconnected with God, to be in harmony with Him. We did this with the teaching. I'll ask the question again. We have all these different interactions Jesus has with people. What are some iconic moments that Jesus has with people? What are some iconic interactions? Woman at the well. Mary. Woman caught in adultery. Zacchaeus. Lazarus. Great one. Barnabas. What else? Nicodemus. What is it? Yeah, yeah. The disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now, some interactions that don't come up is uh, with the Pharisees. But keep in mind, that's also how Jesus lives, right? And this is what's interesting about Nicodemus, whoever said that specifically, is he was one of them. It wasn't that they were one of them, is that they refused to have any sense of humility. There was a self-righteousness. And so there was a righteous anger, indignation that Jesus actually had. And then you see the way he treated the woman at the well, the woman caught in the act of adultery, um, on the road to Emmaus, all these different interactions. And you're going, oh, again, now we see how Jesus lived. And now I know what God is like. That's a powerful thing. By the way, the God whose image we are made in. And just to keep it in the grand scheme of things, I want to remind us, we were made in the image of God. There was a brokenness that occurred. But there was a plan for redemption. And all it takes is us accepting his son, Jesus, believing in him, not just in the things he did and these interactions and the words he said, but specifically, like scripture says, the work on the cross and the resurrection from death. And then we actually can rule and reign the way that Jesus did, with humility and love and patience. There's actually a cheat code in the book of Galatians. There's, there's a thing that is written to these believers in the city of Galatia that's like, if you live by the Spirit of God, these are the things that it will produce in your life. The Spirit, like, so this is also what God is like. In Galatians chapter 5, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the image of God. This is what God is like. And so to understand what God is like, we must learn what Jesus is like. How do we do that? It's actually really easy. We have to study his life. More than likely, when you picked a career or... Um, even as a kid, if there was something you wanted to do, you know, I, I wanted, 
I was convinced, I know I've shared this dream, I was going to play NBA basketball one day. I was convinced. So I had players that I watched. It was a mixture between Isaiah Thomas and Bill Lambeer. That's a bad dude, by the way. If you could combine those two people, those of you that watch basketball in the 80s and 90s, it, it's, it's tough. But like I watched everything they did. I watched how Isaiah handled the ball. I watched how he passed. I watched how he cut. I watched, I watched. If you want to have a job, you become an apprentice of sorts. You, somebody trains you. You watch what they do. Maybe you go to school for it so you can learn the things you need to learn. As a dad, there's other dads I look at and I go, I want a dad more like that. Moms, we look at a mom, the way she interacts, the way she does things, we go, I want to be more like that. And so we watch and we emulate, we study their life. If we want to take ruling and reigning seriously, we have to study the life of Jesus. There's no better way to study the life of Jesus than by reading the accounts of his life in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Same story, different viewpoints. Read them. Read them like your life depends on it. Read the words that Jesus, some Bibles even put the words Jesus says in red. It's like cheats for you. It's like in college when I buy a used book and someone like did the favor of highlighting everything. You're like, oh, thank you, Lord. I bought a cheap book. Study his life. Look at his interactions, not just as like some narrative, but like as a, I need to study Jesus' life so that I can see what God is like. And then through prayer. And simply by asking this, pray this prayer, God, help me to know you. Help me to know you. I mean, James is pretty clear on this in James chapter 1, verse 5. If you need wisdom, ask our generous God. And he'll give it to you. And he's not going to rebu- rebuke you for asking. Just ask for wisdom. God, help me to understand you more. So that I can understand myself more. I, I can understand whose image I am made in. So I can rule and reign the way you have intended me. And so this stop in this week is just kind of one more piece to this image of God puzzle, and we'll pick it up next week. But it's important that we understand this overarching timeline. So God, we thank you that you have created us in your image. God, we pray that you would forgive us when we use our authority that you've given us to cause harm, to hurt, to commit evil. That's why we're overjoyed that you have reconciled us to yourself. You've been able to put us back into harmony with you so that we can actually rule and reign the way you've created us to the same way your son Jesus did. love and with patience, with kindness, with goodness, with faithfulness, with mercy. That we can also look at these injustices that take place and know that is not good and I will use my ruling and reigning to do something about that. Help us to see us, ourselves, as these image bearers of you and to not see that as a thing that is worthless, but value that is just beyond belief. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Would you stand and sing with us again this morning?
So, so good to be with all of you. Have a great week. Grab some M&Ms on the way out. We love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.